pretended to be close to me started running from me. another man unless he loves that man honors that man reveres that man and looks up to that man as his hero my little son Farrakhan Khalid Muhammad almost struck by a nine millimeter bullet found three other nine millimeters in a sack found a 30 odd six rifle with a scope waiting to take my life I have waded through the blood of an assassination attempt I have sat in the hall and in the dungeons of the white man's prison. I have stood up against the most awesome crackers of the world. The White House against me, the Senate against me, the Congress against me, the governor, the mayor, the police, the army, the navy, the air force, the FBI, the CIA. God damn it, I don't fear nothing but God himself. Only God and God alone. Only God and God alone. Greetings, family. I am Dr. Ali, and welcome to Aboriginal Global Media. We are covering today a great one, another documentary. And this particular documentary is about the life of Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad, a very famous leader during the 20th century, a member of the Nation of Islam, and a leader in the New Black Panther Party. Dr. Khalid Muhammad serves as a great inspiration in my life because he was one of the early leaders who introduced me to a knowledge of self. And there were a few other people, but Dr. Khalid gave the tenacity, the scholarship, the youthful energy that in my younger period, I needed as an inspiration to begin my journey in traveling, in studying, and in deciding myself at that particular time to become a member of the Nation of Islam. I am in my 40s, and so many of you who may be in your 30s or 20s may have never even heard of Dr. Khalid Muhammad, or yet pieces and parts of his life. You don't know the details that I am about to espouse and uh, go over. And so I do think it's important to go over aspects of his life that some of you who've been around, hey, you already know these things. But for those who have not been around, they need this particular uh, information about Dr. Khalid so they can ground themselves on who is this particular person that Dr. Ali is talking about, and more importantly, why is he talking about him? I do know that the most important thing for you is to connect with me and comprehend why am I even doing this? Why do a documentary on Dr. Khalid Muhammad's life? And he died in 2001. That's now about 23 years ago. And this is just not to tell a story about him. 
I'm pretty sure there are thousands of videos. You can Wikipedia him, look him up, even talk to some people who uh, knew him personally and can share some very valuable things. That's not why I'm here, or it's partially. The greatest reason for me talking about Dr. Khalid Muhammad is the reason why I did a documentary on Malcolm X. The reason why I do documentaries on indigenous history, on all of our leaders, it is to learn the valuable lessons that a life leaves for us. What are we to learn about the assassination of Dr. Khalid Muhammad? What are we to learn about his interaction with Minister Farrakhan? What are we to learn about his purpose and his early joining of the Nation of Islam around 1970 and his opportunity as a young man in college to see the messenger for himself, to see the nation fall, to later travel across the globe. He worked with Idi Amin. He's worked with Muammar Gaddafi. And so this is not an average man. This is a young man who had global experience in the cause of liberation for peoples. And so because of his unique experience and because of the outcome, his life is now an equation. And I am the code breaker. I go back, I review the great strides that people have made, the accomplishments, what are we to gain from those, and the part that most people don't like for me to talk about, their mistakes, or the things that they did that can be improved upon, that can be learned from, that can avoid myself being assassinated, and maybe you, because maybe you are a real one who is out here in the world, living your purpose, and also joining with others for a group purpose amongst indigenous people anywhere throughout the globe, North America, Caribbean, South America, Africa, wherever you are. And one unique phenomenon that exists on the planet right now, 2024, that is evidence that we need to talk about. Dr. Khalid Muhammad, Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Marcus Garvey, Noble Drew Ali, whoever it may be, uh, other leaders in other parts of the world. One phenomenon, and that one phenomenon is if we look across the earth and we ask ourselves, where are the indigenous people on all these continents that I just mentioned being controlled by institutions from foreigners? We can go to the housing, the real estate, the banking. We can go to the energy production, the militaries, the actual governments or if we have governments that are headed by various groups of indigenous peoples in the Caribbean, Africa, and other places, their institutions are pretty much controlled by outsiders. And if they're not, they're so uh, lacking in influence, it doesn't matter. Now we flip that, that same equation, and ask ourselves, where can we go and find so-called black people or indigenous people anywhere on the planet anywhere that are running infrastructure, institutions, operations, systems that dominate non-indigenous people in Europe, Asia, the West, anywhere, nowhere. So this is the effect of colonization and the effect of colonization puts a stress on indigenous peoples that is unnatural. And so now we get people who stand up, who try to implement small and large things to help fix this equation. And in their efforts to do so, they end up like Dr. Khalid Muhammad. They end up like Malcolm X. They end up like Nat Turner. They end up like anyone who stands for a cause to liberate and free people. So that says 
that if you or I am going to stand up to do such an act, we could suffer a similar outcome if we don't have a better strategy. So we review these things and these are psychoanalytical reviews of leadership and the pitfalls of attempting to be a political leader or community leader or any other type of leader where the situation could put you in danger. And not only does that situation put you in danger with opposing non-Indigenous people, more importantly, more importantly, this is the part that I stress, it puts you in danger amongst your own people who are willing to do various, very, very dangerous and evil things to you just because you want to stand up. Maybe they want your position. Maybe they're jealous. Maybe they're a gatekeeper. Who knows? But these things have happened. These things will happen. And for those who are in a position to be wiser, to have higher levels of strategy, we need to employ those strategies and we need to talk to each other. So Aboriginal Global Media is dedicated to sharing the past so that our future will improve and the life of Harold Moore, of Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad is a life that we want to review because of the reverence we have for this mighty soldier, this great sword of Allah. And in this review, you will learn things that you have never learned. You will have questions asked that have not been posed, and this will put us in a better position to aid in the uplifting, the freedom, the justice, the equality of all humans on this earth. Okay, now here's my caveat. There will be various people who will be named in this documentary, this presentation of facts. And when you review this, if you review this, you need to understand the intent of the author, who is me. If I mention Malik Zulu Shabazz, or Farrah Gray, or Minister Farrakhan, or Kiana M. Bush, or any of these other people, this is a review of a man's life who is dead. You all are alive. All right. And many of the people who I just mentioned either watched or witnessed Khalid Muhammad die. And so death is irreversible. I do not falsely accuse anyone of doing anything. And since I've been covering the story, which has been quite a while, I haven't falsely accused any of the people who I named above. I only presented questions. I gathered evidence and proofs. I use your own statements at various times that you have made about these things. And I have questioned you publicly. You could have taken the time to address these things. Kiana Ambush never did a documentary on Dr. Khalid, never did an interview, never gave any input, and she was a witness. Farrah Gray, multimillionaire at uh, the age of 14, or a millionaire, and kept growing. You are the son of this great leader, to my knowledge. You have not done one documentary on your father. Millions of dollars. One of the greatest revolutionaries to ever live. In the sense of inspiring people to wake up. Millions of people across the globe. Not one documentary. Malik Zulu Shabazz. I believe that you've written a book. And that book just came out. Maybe what? Last two years or so. Um, everybody has their own space and time of how they deal with the pain of losing a brother or a sister. But I pose questions to you and you lied on camera and said that I should have and I did. I actually have the records and I keep very good records. I presented something called the People's Indictment and I asked you very detailed questions about things that you said by the pen 
of your own hand or typewriter or however you want to put it. You put public statements out in video, in written form, and I question you based on the things that you said and you never address those things. Minister Farrakhan, we've questioned you on this publicly as well in the same way and you never addressed it because you probably feel like you don't have to. I know you feel like you don't have to and you don't have to because we all have a choice. But this is pressure now. And I promise you, my good fellow brothers and sisters, without any string of violence, I am a different type of pressure. And it all deals with elevating the minds of the people into a certain level of awareness of who is actually around them. Can we actually trust them? What did they say over here versus over here? Would they go to the level of jealousy or envy to want or desire the life of their own said brother? These are questions that we are posing. And as we go into this documentary and deal with the life of this great soldier who have inspired millions Whoever is responsible for his death, all of you, from what I have seen, except for one, because I've never heard Kiana Ambush make one statement, but I have found her. Everybody was looking for her. I found her. Found James Best, too. Yep, I found him. You'll find out who these people are. Kiana Ambush was the former wife of Dr. Khaled Muhammad and James Edward Best was the man who carried out an attempted assassination on Dr. Khaled Muhammad in 1994. And so besides those two, my evaluation in this particular documentary is to present facts about your behavior surrounding the life and death of Dr. Khaled Abdul Muhammad. And may the pressure bus pipes. All right, family, let's go into some very interesting history about the origins and lineage of Howard Moore or Howard Van, as we know him as Khalid Abdul Muhammad. Now, you can do a simple Wikipedia search and it comes up that Carol Moore Van raised Howard Moore and he used the name Moore and Van interchangeably. Even in college, he would use the word last name Van. And so what I found is that Carol Moore, her maiden name was Moore, had a sister named Bernice. But Bernice stopped showing up on the census. She shows up on the 1920 census and then disappears. Carol Moore continues to be shown on censuses all the way up to the 1950 census, which is the census that I'm using to say, okay, we have uh, Dr. Khalid on the 1950 census under his name, Howard Moore. But the history is sketchy because his aunt raised him, according to what we are told. His mother may have passed. I have never him, heard him recount this history, so I'm going based on the public records that are available. And his grandmother, the mother of Carrie and Bernice, changed her name to McNeil, Cora McNeil. Cora McNeil was Cora Moore. And so we have cases of his auntie actually being raised by her grandparents and him having a connection to his great grandparents who are William Moore and Nancy Moore. But here's where it gets interesting. I followed his matrilineal line. And once I get to his great grandmother, which is Nancy Moore, I go to uh, her parents 
and her parents are named Emma Roberts and Hamp Cherry. So Emma Roberts shows up on the doll's roll and she's Cherokee. And Hamp Cherry, I think is a pseudo name for his great, great grandfather because he was Cherokee. Because you know how this last name stuff got switched up. And so I know for certain that his great, great grandmother was Cherokee, absolutely without a doubt. And that um, as the names come down, Nancy, if you look up her records, they'll say her last name was unknown and she married as a Moore, but her last name was Cherry or her mother's name, Roberts. And so we do have once again, just like I did Malcolm X, we are here to prove that although Dr. Khalid was a staunch Pan-African, we have no boats that tie him to any place in Africa, but we have his lineage by way of his great, great grandmother, who is Emma Roberts, who shows up on the dolls rolls. I was not able to find a father for him. I have uh, speculations about why. I'll save that for later documentaries where we get more advanced abilities to gather data. But for now, Khalid Muhammad's lineage says he is Shalaki or Shalaki, which uh, became Cherokee at a later date and his family uh, was from Mississippi and parts of Virginia moving all the way into Tennessee, which is where you would find the Shalaki at you know those times. And so it's wonderful to be able to do history on our brothers and sisters because we can kill all of the speculation about where their lineage is from and where everybody is from and actually get data. So that is a resounding and powerful uh, statement for our brother, uh, Dr. Khalid. We have found some interesting information on his lineage. This is the 1998 Million Youth March.
event and the context of that will become greater as this documentary unveils as you can see in 1998 standing right by his left is his son Farrakhan Muhammad who now goes by the name Farrah Gray and so uh, in 1998 he would have been 16 or maybe 15, 15 around that time. All right. Um, give or take a year. And so you can see he's standing by his father there. As we proceed further, you're going to see more and more lectures. He's standing by his father. He's standing by his father. 
And that becomes important because of what he stated from his own mouth was a lie. And um, for whatever purposes, strategy or whatever you want to continue to distance yourself from your father, that's fine. You have no issue with that. But the controversy surrounding Dr. Khalid Muhammad is directly tied to Minister Farrakhan. That's the greatest of the controversy and all the other parts of branches. My assessment, as we are going to unfold these videos and hear the words of the minister, hear lots of words from Dr. Khalid. Dr. Khalid was a loyal brother. He had a heart of gold. It's only, you don't make those kind of people often in life. You don't meet those kind of people and you don't make those kind of people. He's a, this is a special brother. But his loyalty was to a disloyal person. And it's just like a bad relationship. You can have a really good woman and she's really a terrible man. And when things get thick, it's going to come out. And it came out. And he saw it later, of course. He, he didn't go his whole life blind. But that blindness is what led to the first assassination attempt almost being successful. And it also led to his death. Because as you will see throughout this documentary, he kept trying to get the attention and got the attention and got some agreements that y'all you, you, people don't know nothing about, but I got him on record stating it, and Minister Farrakhan has stated it in another context, lying about it. But we're talking about the same events. Khalid Muhammad actually made it back into the nation. Most people don't know that. And then he was put on ice. He was shelved. And why was he shelved? Because he was used. Minister Farrakhan had a covenant and as we go through this documentary, you're going to see with the Congressional Black Caucus and other leaders, Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, Kwesi Fumu, y'all know, y'all know the list. And this was in September of 1994. I'm recounting this as a, a short history because we're going to go through it, but I want you to get the context. 1993, excuse me, September of 1993. November of 1993 is when Dr. Khalid made the famous King College speech, where he's just going in, the students invited him, they gave him the subject, and he just, you know, he did his Dr. Khaled thing. And all hell broke loose. February of that year, Minister Farrakhan comes out and he does a press conference and he dis, this is his words, not suspend was not the word that was used. Dismiss Dr. Khaled. Early February. A few weeks later, towards the end of February, Dr. Khaled gets censored by the United States Congress. And that will be in here so you can see that censorship. And condemning him. So now... He's on a big stage now. April, he hits Phil Donahue. Y'all know the famous Donahue where he just tore Donahue down to pieces. Dr. Khaled was intelligent, brilliant, eloquent, well-spoken, sharp, military demeanor, but a scholar. And so that Momentum, Donahue, censored by U.S. Congress, dismissed by Minister Farrakhan, King College speech, all led up to the first assassination attempt, which was in late May of 1994. He survived that. And so that brought him further into a great stage. But you have to pay attention because... Between the time that he was dismissed by Minister Farrakhan and his assassination, 
Mr. Farrakhan announces the Million Man March. And so that becomes the precipice of understanding all of this. Because Khalid was brought back and was doing speeches all the way up to the day before the Million Man March. And guess what? When they had that event on October the 15th, a bunch of people was invited. Two people in particular did not show up. Two people. Karenga and Al Sharpton. And they ended up speaking at the Million Man March the next day. They didn't, they were invited to the event with Khalid the day before. They didn't show up. Guess what? Khalid, after doing all of that work to galvanize the youth and get people and brought back into the nation, guess what? Not allowed to speak at the Million Man. March. You see, Dr. Khalid had the ear of the youth. Hip hop. You see him with Ice Cube, even though he later dissed Ice Cube. Tupac. Khalid had the ear of the youth. And he was galvanizing them. In the 90s, it was cool to have a knowledge of self and to be disciplined in hip hop. It was cool to love your people. It was cool to talk your talk. Cause you know, we saw what happened in hip hop. You know, you got a little lady play, but it was respect. So Pac could talk about whatever, whatever with a shorty, but then he had dear mama. This man was set up. They tried to kill him. It failed in 1994. And they said after that, everywhere he goes, he got guns now. Lots of them. How are we going to kill him? I'm getting to the point. Because this documentary is going to lay it out. How are we going to kill him? He must die. He is an international leader, pro-black, aware. He was cool with the Moors. He was cool with the Africans. He was cool with all of this. This indigenous information hadn't come out. I was in college during this time. Just started my studies from when the emperors dropped the information, late 90s. And so I was coming up under all of this and that indigenous information was being birthed at that time, but then he got knocked off and then I started climbing. But I, as a very young man, teenager, watched this. And what I'm saying to you is now, in retrospect, that I am alive, healthy, with a very clear mind, I see it all. They killed this brother to ensure what they were making sure that never happened with Malcolm and making sure that the plan of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad or anything like it never came to surface. This is the black elite. Yes, as Steve Coakley is in this documentary, he will tell you the boule, the gentry, the black gatekeepers. And Minister Farrakhan allied with them for the purposes of his wealth and his fame. And that is the end. And Khalid had to go and they had to figure it out. And everybody else that's around, Malik Zulu Shabazz and Hashim and Zinga, who, who all did very suspicious things. But there's a bigger order here. And the order is and this is the hard part. Khalid did not know how to protect himself from that order and class of people. 
He allowed the emotions and the pain of the betrayal to sink deep into him. He kept going as a soldier, but it bothered him. And I'm sending out a warning to all of you youngins who are watching. <laughs> Their betrayal does not bother me one bit. <laughs> this is why I'm, it's very easy for me to critique Minister Farrakhan and others. You know, some of my brothers, even in Arna, who have been in the nation, we all been FOI, and they, they, they struggling with it. I'm not made like that. I'm so glad I am third polarity Gemini. But I'm going off on a tangent because we're about to get into this documentary in the deep parts. My point to you is, this is easy to see. And it goes back to the Malcolm documentary that I did and the Elijah's vision that will drop right after this. We know who you are. Right? And I'm going to tell the people who you are so that the people can make a decision about building what they need, which is indigenous autonomy for our people globally. That is the solution. Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad becomes one of our deified ancestors, an icon, a lesson of what to do and what not to do. And we will take these lessons and move forward. All right, so let's jump on this part of the documentary dealing with Kiana Ambush. Kiana Ambush was a young lady, according to the best knowledge that we have, that worked at a store right here in ATL called Freedman's. Freedman's is owned by a Jewish family. You will see pictures of very popular athletes, Shaquille O'Neal, Magic Johnson, all of these various athletes, because Freedmen's is special because they serve athletes with very large feet, vintage shoes and high priced shoes. And so all these stars, you know, they go to Freedmen's. They know this is their Jewish connection. Kiana Ambush worked for these Jews. So who introduced Khalid Muhammad to a woman who works with Jews? It was, according to the best knowledge that we have, Hashim and Zynga. But why would Hashim and Zynga be shopping at Friedman's? Ouch. This is where we start to raise our questions. Because if you go to Friedman's, the store is still there, and you look at this documentary, as I'm showing all of the famous athletes, six, nine, seven feet, big feet people. Who around Khalid Muhammad had big feet? Malik Zulu Shabazz? Have you ever shopped at Freeman's? That's my questions to you. It's one of my questions to you. I don't know. I don't have proof. I don't, I'm not able to look at your bank statements from that time period. But some kind of way, y'all got into that store. And it's been put on Hashim. Hashim is dead. He died of cancer. One week after the fake leader of the Black Panthers in the movie died of cancer. <clears throat> this gets very interesting. So much so that the speech that triggered all of this at Keene College, K-E-A-N, I'm going off on my metaphysical tangent right now. Keene College, the lady that I'm talking about has the same letters in her name, K-E-A-N, but her name is Kean, and the college was Keene, and her last name is Ambush. All right, let's get back to the facts. So she works there. So somebody, according to what we are told, it was Hashim and Zynga. We can't question Hashim, but Malik is saying, hey, it was Hashim that introduced pretty. And every, every time I notice something, Malik, because you're going to watch this. Every time you mention Kian Ambush, you always talk about how pretty she was. I noticed that. Go look at his videos on these and, oh, she was pretty. Oh, oh she was pretty. Interesting. So uh, I'm going to allege that you were shopping at the store because you have 
big feet. You're like six five, six six, and um, you know more than you're saying. But so for some reason, you're just not saying it. And so he met this young lady, and three months after he met her, he was dead. She has not made any statements. The only statements that we have from her are by way of Malik Zulu Shabazz. I found her picture. Y'all know I am the one. I found her picture. I found her LinkedIn profile. Hell, I got a phone number and her addresses, but I ain't about to put that out. But here we have a scenario where one of the greatest leaders of our time dies. She attends the funeral. Then she disappears. What happened to her? Well, I followed her life. And not from that time period, because I wasn't, you know, aware of her like that. But now, as I'm doing the documentary research, I follow her life. And she does marry some preacher guy. 2008, she goes through some bankruptcies. So she wasn't well off financially. She didn't get paid a lot of money. She uh, got some houses foreclosed on. She was struggling. So, if she was there with Dr. Khaled, after he left the All-Star game, drove down with Hashim and Zinga and some other brothers, they stopped in, according to the Panther News report, they stopped in South Carolina at a Waffle House, and then he got dropped off on February 12th, 2001, around 3 p.m. in Atlanta to his wife. That's the story we're given by Malik Zulu Shabazz. And that night, according to Malik, not according to her, they made love, they fell asleep, he woke up throwing up, going crazy. They ate at a Chinese restaurant that evening. He starts throwing up. Now it's very possible that could have been food poisoning, right? You're going to get to that. He throws up. According to Malik, this is all according to Malik Panther News. I got all of the papers. I'm showing it in this documentary. So, according to Malik, reporting based on what he's saying that he got from Kian Ambush. Dr. Khalid had this episode around 12 at night and stayed in that bathroom till around 8.30ish. When the, pan, when the uh, ambulance came and got him. So that is the story we have of Ken Ambush. We have no statements from her. No one's talked to her. She doesn't have like millions of dollars and leaving some secret life. I can look up anybody that exists. She's pretty much older, you know, living a low to moderate income, struggling. So if they put her up to poison Khalid, then they just... Said, be quiet and live your poor life. If. Uh, but we don't know if he's poisoned or not. And it's directly related to Malik too. We'll get to that. But my synopsis on Kiana Ambush. Is that we don't know what happened in that house. Because we're only getting Malik's word. Nobody else. We've never heard from Kiana Ambush. We're just being told by way of Malik. What happened. And she is quiet. And he is the only one talking. And she was found in a store with Jews that sell very high-priced shoes to athletes with big feet or large-sized shoes. So we have questions for you, Malik. And we've asked those questions, but we'll ask them again. Did you shop at Freedman's? How do we know the statements that you gave by way of saying Kiana said this and Kiana told me that? How do we know that those are true? Are you willing to take a lie detector test? Are you willing to go live at any time and allow me to question you. Ken Ambush, if you ever see this, would you like to do 
an interview with me? I doubt it. I doubt whether both of those will. But we don't even need that. I had to say that, though. But we don't need that. We don't need that. All right? And so, my dear sister, Kian Ambush, my summary on you is you're afraid. Somebody told you to be quiet. And you did exactly what they told you to do. I see your pictures online. I see you just trying to live a quiet life, hustling, trying to make it. And so, regardless of what other people are saying about you, I've done my research to see that if you did do something, you've been told to be quiet. And if you did do something, somebody told you to do it. And that somebody is powerful. And so that's all I have to say about Ken Ambush. She is a woman who's living her life and we should let her live her life and stay out of it. If she ever wants to come and speak and say something, we can offer her protection and she would be fine. But it's not necessary for the sake of what we have to do here. No, brother, I didn't like what my father did to my little brother, Tony Malik Shabazz, like that in front of everyone. I was the first to call the million. We all love you for that. And if you heard the tapes or Brother Clemson Brown's video or any of the others, or if you were there, you know we gave props to Minister Farrakhan from the beginning to the end. And if you, if you visited our website on the World Wide Web, we invited him. I didn't expect him to come. And I'm nobody's puppy dog. I'm not going to tuck my tail and go sniffing behind. Nobody, Louis Farrakhan, didn't teach me that way. Much of what I am by the power of God and the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and what they put in him he put it in me. And that's the way I'm going to be from here on out. I'm not changing. I got one letter from Minister Farrakhan in five years. One letter in five years, though I had written him. I called him repeatedly. You've heard me talk about it right at the UAM forum for years. He set up meetings and postponed the meetings. When I was in the hospital, shot down like a dog. He never visited me. He never sent me a letter. Never sent me a postcard. Not a penny, not a nickel, not a dime. The whole damn time. I know what happened between Malcolm and the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And how Malcolm's letters were being intercepted. High calls were being intercepted, so I know when to reach my father, so I would call him early in the morning when I knew he would answer the phone. And I would sometimes speak directly to him. And he would be just as nice and promise that we would meet and there were no meetings. I stopped doing that and I said everywhere he was going to speak, I would go and sit on the front row or the second row to say, here I am. Will you see me? Can we talk? Can we work this out? I'm, I want to come back. Remember how dedicated I've been? Remember how committed I've been? How devoted I've been? Remember I was with you when your son was not with you. I was with you when your daughters were not with you. I was with you when none of the nation of Islam was with you. Remember me. I'm the one who used to pack two pistols to make sure that nobody would do anything to you. I'm the one who would stand next to you with a gun and a Bible. I'm the one who was willing to take a bullet for you if an enemy stood up to shoot you down. I would sit on the front row, the second row, begging almost, pleading. What in the hell do I look like five years later calling a man saying we're having the Million Youth March. Will you come and help us please, sir? Hell no. We still invited him because it was the right thing to do. But we don't have
have to consult you. We consult God and God alone. God damn it. What's the next question? All right, we're doing this in parts. So now we're talking about Farrah Gray. Oh my, Farrah Gray is very popular. He's the author of Rillionaire. And he's a successful businessman, has been since he was very young. And this is uh, dialogue, not to falsely accuse him, not to do anything, but to evaluate the situation. Kali was our big brother, that's his father. So obviously you love your father in most cases. Sons love their father. I have sons and I'm raising them. And so I do have questions though. Here is a video that you can evaluate that's gonna start me to ask the questions that I wanna ask. I already showed you the million youth march where Farrah Gray, or at the time, Farrah Khan. That's your name. You changed it to Farrah Gray, so we're going to call you by your name. You stand right by your daddy at the Million Youth March. You were born in 1984. All right. So you about 15, 14, 15 years old. On this video, you're younger. And look what your father thought of you. See my son Farah Khan, give him a strong black hand. Many of you, many of you have watched him grow up right before your eyes. Very strong young man, very brilliant young man, very conscious and committed, and I just love him, love him, love him. <laughs> Where's his wife? That's his queen. Look how beautiful this queen is. Give her a strong black hand, brothers and sisters. This is a beautiful queen. Beautiful sister. Devil, how did you get that sister? You got one of our best sisters, you no good bastard. What'd you say, sister? Yes. Yes, ma'am. This is a pretty special presentation that he hasn't seen of Brother Muhammad, but he made some statements, and I want to let you know his son, to me, is a warrior, and it makes my, I want my son to be like him. He stood the whole time at attention and listened and absorbed everything his father was saying. If we have children that has been reared up like this son, with the information, like if I was a kid with this information growing up like him, we wouldn't have no problems today. There is no... Okay. So we see your father loved you. What you would have thought of. You're very trained, very young. But I have a problem. And not with the video. The video is beautiful. The people commended you for, you know, even you, your ability to stand post. I'm FOI. I know how that is. I've done... Uh, six hours outside on a building, making sure the minister is secure. So we understand that. But the problem that we have is these next videos and how you talked about how you became who you are. I was really good at my wow. now, now, you had to have mom and daddy helping you out a little bit, right? Uh, what, what, how, how does that happen? My uh, biggest accomplishment was being able to retire my mother and my grandmother. Didn't grow up with my father in the house, but uh, still a very loving, phenomenal man. Every time I got a chance to spend time with him, he was a black leader uh, and activist. So didn't grow up with him, but I was able and he was uh, to succeed and he was able to see that before he passed when I was younger. Now, how do people get involved? Like you actually had some financial type of learn how to do it. Now, Oprah, okay, you were featured on Oprah. Tell us about that experience. Definitely an honor. She is not only the queen of talk shows, she's the queen of television. So um, to be recognized by Oprah Magazine, Oprah and Friends, uh, they did a nice piece uh, where they chronicled my success journey, uh, which has been obviously based on faith as my foundation. It aired twice last year on the Oprah Winfrey Network. Um, and that ultimately led to me being honored this year as one of the top 100 uh, modern black history makers for the GRIO uh, NBC uh, list. Awesome. Now you're doing, you're doing some amazing things. And so now we know one thing about you, and that is that you're a liar. 
for whatever purpose. You did not want to give your father credit for raising you up and being there for you and giving you all the tools that make you who you are today, the skill set, the watching him speak and your eloquent ability to address the public. All of the input that he gave you to make you a millionaire came from your daddy, boy. You got up on that camera just now. You started talking about Oprah and uh, your mama and your grandmother. And you should give them credit. You know, I'm pretty sure they're beautiful women. Boy, you know your daddy is turning over in his grave. And so now, after your father gets censored by the United States Congress in a censor motion, Signed by then President Bill Clinton. We see you with Bill Clinton at a conference for youth or whatever. Don't you know that I know that the Secret Service knows who you were and you are and who your daddy was who was alive at the time. Bill Clinton goes on to endorse you, endorse your book personally. Banks come along and put your face on credit cards. You're the first African-American to be 14 and to be a millionaire because of your daddy. And now your father is gone. Here is my empathy. You could have looked at this situation and said, man, all of them niggas sold my daddy out. I ain't touching that. Because that community ain't nothing but a bunch of backstabbing Judases. I actually agree with you. If you were to think that way. I've experienced it. But here we go. You're 39 years old. If what they're saying about you is true, you've made enough wealth for the next generation. Where's your documentary on your father? Where's your book about your father? Where is your story about your father? I am a naturopath doctor, a biochemist. I'm a historian and what I have labeled a new age government manager to build indigenous governments. I've written over 36 books. I got all kinds of things to do. I took time out of my schedule to make sure your father's life is being remembered properly and that we learn the lessons. Where is yours? There's something very wrong. Now, I'm not slow. I see all the promises and I know how they happen. You're here with Obama. You're here with Clinton. You're here with, uh, yeah, you on this Harvard panel and talk about this. Yeah, the connections. It was you and Kian and other family members who decided to pull the plug the life support on your father. Of course, you had recommendations from doctors and they're saying this, but this is college bombing. Life support gets usually pulled because it costs, it's costly to keep the life support going. They're going to run up a bill on you. But you, you had money. I even heard Malik Zulu Shabazz say, Dr. Khaled was poor. And I'm wondering, you made your, your son a multimillionaire. Is Malik lying by saying that Khaled Muhammad was riding on a bus and that the Rolls Royce was parked? Was he lying? Or was he telling the truth? 
that you had already disconnected yourself from your father in his last years. But wait, we have video. Going all the way up to certain points. So now all of y'all just saying things, it's not making sense. So yes, I'm highly suspicious of you, young man. Not just because of your strategy to build up your network. That's not, that's, that's normal asymmetrical warfare. I'm not these black power people who call people sellouts because they don't do what I think they should do. I have nothing to do with that. Your purpose is your purpose in life. But your daddy is Khalid Abdul Muhammad. And so, y'all decided to pull the plug on him for whatever purposes, very quickly. They had a funeral to bury Dr. Khaled, and you went right back to your millionaire lifestyle and lied to the people on camera as we see now. Basically saying your father ain't really had nothing to do with it when it's on tape. But it was on VCR and DVDs back then. We still got it, brother, in this digital age. Farrah Gray, I have questions for you. And they're pretty meticulous. But here's the one question that I will pose to you that is a heart question. How could you do that to your father? That's the one question that's the most important. All right, I got to hit my man Steve Coakley up. Steve Coakley. <laughs> you know what's interesting about Steve Coakley? We share the same birthday, and that king of clubs will eat you up in research. And so Steve Coakley knew exactly what was happening, and he talked about this to Khaled to make Khaled aware of what was happening around him when he was still sort of emotional about it. But Steve Coakley has put out things that people have never reviewed about the death of Dr. Khalid Muhammad and the first assassination attempt and many things about these key players that are in these places. Steve Coakley is known for exposing the boule, the gatekeepers of the black community, the politicians and the businessmen and women who sift through the fraternities and sororities for black excellence and make sure that they are herded into a high level of integration to make sure the white establishment is not ever attacked by anybody black, never threatened, and if so, they will deal with it. So Steve Coakley breaks down James Edward Best, the man who is from Moss Number 25 in Seattle, Washington, and who put him up to do what he was attempting to do, which was assassinate Dr. Khalid. Steve Coakley uniquely also points out the fact that there was a second shooter, two shooters. So the report said five shots and there were 11 shots. Ain't no magic bullets, we had two shooters. Never got the second shooter. Khalid Muhammad himself broke down the fact that he had to jump out of a moving limo because the security he was given for Moss number 27 was new and he felt that they were trying to set him up. He got out of the car while it was moving. They tried to get him to go out of the back where they had a uh, rifle with a scope. They had cut out the fence and they were going to uh, take him out. Khalid Muhammad is in these videos that I'm going to show you after uh, I'm done talking where the JDL is outside and they came in, but they were armed. So in Riverside, California, May 29th, 1994, Khalid Muhammad was supposed to die. And he didn't. He survived. And after that survival, Steve Coakley was the man who was on point, breaking down everybody who was around him and what was going on 
and Minister Farrakhan's position and why would the nation want him dead and who are these other key people and why they wanted to keep Steve Coakley away from Dr. Khaled and how Dr. Khaled went after Steve Coakley just to make sure that he had the ability to have input into what was developing around the Million Man March and the movement during that particular time. Steve Coakley laid the whole thing out and you are about to hear him talk. Getting our head on an enemy, one that we can, we can describe with All right. So, <laughs> as the program got closer, and Tony Martin was added to the program, and Leonard Jeffries was added to the program, and, and then all of the little local community people in Washington were brought into the program. As Brother Dr. Collett came to D.C. the night before the program, in fact, Mr. Farrakhan was in D.C. that night, and they had a private dinner with the people putting on the program. Uh, brother Malik Shabazz, who you might have saw on uh, Connie Chung. In fact, he's the brother on the page in the video. You see him sitting in the back of this video. That's Brother Malik Shabazz there. In fact, he's from, he's down there from L.A. That's where he come from. Uh, and uh, they were talking out the program. And somewhere in the discussion, it came down that, on the discussion, one discussion after that one, that it'd be very difficult to assemble what one reporter called the anti-Semitic dream team and not invite Brother Cole. Because to make people stand there, if they call this out as the team and Brother Cole is still standing in the dugout, somebody's going to question, is this a real team or is this a team of only certain types? And so, Brother Dr. Collins reached out and called me the night before that program, and I did not call him back. That next morning, he went on the morning talk show, one in which I'm banned on, W-O-L, with Kathy Hughes' talk show. I'm banned on that show. And uh, I'm banned from fighting on the Boulay and these other things, uh, which the head of the Boulay just recently came to Washington looking for someone to inform on me. He expressed all of the uh, agitation I had done and that was making him uncomfortable. <laughs> I'm proud of those things. <laughs> but, but... He got on the air that morning and he said, you know, if we're really going to win this war, we're going to have to name the names. All right. He said, huh? So then he said, if anybody out there knows Brother Copley, will you call him this morning and have him accept my open invitation to be in this program and accept my humble omission of him from the program? And about 50 people called my house, like 7 a.m. Boom, 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 boom. Man, Brother Collins on the radio. And you ought to be at the program tonight. Well, so well, maybe I'll hear from Brother Collins. And after he got off the show, he got back to the hotel, he called me. We talked for an hour and a half. And we had a very, very, very deep discussion. <laughs> I remember a brother calling me uh, when the Dr. Collins situation had gone down and he was being suspended uh, by uh, Brother Minister Farrakhan. And I remember looking at the suspension, getting chills. I mean, literally, the damn thing gave me chills when he said vile and repugnant. I mean, my wow. went, Ooh, I, I can't tell you what that felt like because that wasn't about college. That was about me and you and about a lot of us because the hunky don't deserve no response. That's the law on the line. And you know I showed that article in the New York Times about colonialism is back. Mm -hmm. It was the New York Times that printed the ad. Now what do we owe a hunky like that? Nothing. Mm -hmm. So I felt that all up in my soul. Mm -hmm. And that shit really gave me chills too. That shit went up my body. Mm -hmm. And that really made me apprehensive. And I had done a tape, some of you all might have got it last time I was here, entitled Confused, the distraction between blacks and is it really the college case. Tape. They listen to the tape. I don't think 
When you be putting somebody's name on the tape, they don't hit the tape. They hit the tape. Listen, you might not know the wire, but the wire flies. The wire does work. Put it out on the wire. I got some wires tonight, too. I'm going to put some wire out. And he said the one thing about the tape that hurt me very badly was that you questioned whether I was a hardcore revolutionary. And he said, brother, you know, over this course of these last moments, a lot of people have raised that question. It's kind of like my moment. And I'm telling you, I'm this hardcore brother. Give me a minute. And if you watch the speeches from when the brother was suspended, the first couple of speeches were very mild. They were mild. They were mild. And people come to the brother and look him right in his eyes and say, what's up, brother? Don't start talking to me. Yeah, I've got to get the brothers right. Yeah, that's all I can call out because we need that clarity. And so... A couple of speeches a little later, bro, start upping it up. Well, if I am suspended, I might as well go on and do what I got to do. And brother sums it up, I'm just a rough nigga. That's it. Hardcore. And when we talked, he explained to me what his feelings were about things that he had to do. And it didn't necessarily mean that had to be his feelings, but in a structure, that's what a soldier do. And this brother has absolute loyalty and love to Brother Minister Farrakhan. Mm -hmm. He absolute has loyalty and love to the brother. But they're not, that does not mean there are not other brothers between him and that brother who mean him no good at all. In fact, in context, if you think about the brother calling assassination attempt, don't forget anything if you don't forget this. Before they could kill Martin, they had to kill Malcolm. Right, yeah. You couldn't do that in reverse. Yeah. If the warrior was still living when the leader died, yeah. he'd start the war. Right. There's probably no other brother in the whole nation of Islam who can activate the military side both within and without present members and old members All right. All right. than Brother Dr. Collins. That's right. And I just At no time during that period, when James Edward Vest, on the inspiration of right. Dr. Ali Muhammad, who felt he had inspired Breast to the point that he suggested that shooting Collett would put him in good favor with the minister. Uh, mm, that's right. That James Edward Vest who, as an outcast member of the Nation of Islam, fitted the profile of the other five men who killed Malcolm X. Some of them were in and out of the nation on suspensions and punishment and dubious behavior like <coughs> James Edward Best. It is clear that there was more than one shooter at Riverside, California in 1994, and in fact, the second shooter had on a white shirt and a red bow tie and was denoted by the brother who wrote for the Sentinel, who's now dead, who covered the trial of O.J. in the braids and other things. He, he's dead now. Uh, brother asthma, couldn't breathe, failure to breathe. Oh, okay. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, but I refer you to the tapes, <laughs> Insights and Reflections, August 16th, 1995, which was after the lecture I gave at the cafe called Insights from the Black Side, which was done just after we had been shot at in front of my mother's apartment in Chicago. Uh, that Insights from the Black Side and Insights from Reflection dealt with pent-up animosity. In fact, at another point in the tape of today's program, Brother, Brother Tony Muhammad says, uh, don't mess with us. We have all this pent-up frustration. Steve Coakley, don't mess with us. We have all this pent-up aggression. We can unleash these things on you. Yes, brother, as we have denoted in the past, you are pent-uply frustrated because you have eaten shit from the honky. Mm. Shit. And with all that shit coming back up your face, and out your mouth like regurgitation, yes, you might focus it over it 
at Steve Coakley and fuck up again. For this time, Steve Coakley, who is not Malcolm X, who is not Bo Wally, who is not Khalis Muhammad, who these names are just a few of the names. Zach Kondo, people who you try to intimidate and pressure because you perpetrate yourself as more than a human, in perfection, beyond reproach. But I understand that the minister would never make such a foolish statement. Only the zealot supporters of the minister would make such a statement, and that is to justify their own support. Who would want to get caught giving a man their all and he be less than perfect, or make mistakes, or work with the government, or get government grants? But getting a government grant is a job when you get it. It was a sellout when the Urban League got it. I was with you when you built your nation on such psychology. Only to turn out to be the grant getter. The government whiner. The pot belly big eater. The delayer of the people's real revolution. Like you said. Brother, if we had only one bullet. And the devil had 40 faces. That one bullet would pierce each layer of the devil's spirit and material being, if it be God's will. Don't ever say you won't fight the enemy because you don't have enough bullets, because you don't have enough money, you don't have enough members, you don't have enough final call administration buildings, you don't have enough final call newspapers to beat the devil either. So we're not going to wait on your program. And you're not going to hold up or impede ours. See, if the program's so fucked up, then step back up off of it and go on about your business and hold your million youth undermining program next year when there's no program scheduled at all. Why don't you do it next year? You can get it all the goods for yourself. But no, right. you know you have to go this year because if you don't go now, who else could you undermine? Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm. So we sit at a serious crossroads, brother. I tell y'all now, y'all gonna see some physical shit come down because this is a physical solution is necessary here. I haven't already seen him shoot it, brother Khalid Muhammad. He will not waver this time over his love for his teacher and spiritual guide. that we move into the spirit. Anyway, nevertheless, uh, we're moving full steam ahead uh, towards New York. And soon there will be a written broadside to uh, your response, Tony Mohammed. But I remember you from insights and reflections of standing up and stating with Ben C. Q. You know that such a thing exists. Then he went on the radio show in L.A. Again, to respond to Steve Coakley. They don't respond to shit the white man say. They respond to Steve Coakley That's in right. a minute. Because the white man is O-F-F. L-I-M-I-T-S. That's off limits. The white man remains off limits. But that's all right. You can step to me. Because I appreciate it. Because I need the clarity. <coughs> Anyway, once having been given the list of the boule, he went on the air and said, I have this list in my hand, but I cannot authenticate it. It could be a fraud. So the question is, since we're going to ask Steve Coakley for his evidence of the nation working with the CIA to undermine the Million Youth March, I must first ask you, Minister Tony, to recluse yourself as one who will review this information in that even holding the list of the boule in your hand was not authentic enough, then maybe the information and the answers to these questions of complicity, even in your hands, couldn't be fairly evaluated. So we put this point to the public that since we raised it to the minister because he brought the question, then we'll put the question to the minister and he must give the answer. Let the man who is attacked step forward. 
to answer to the question, let no lesser man go beyond his weight and seek a solution for a question he can't answer. You turn TV off, probably. Remember Tony Muhammad stating there was no boule? I remember Tony Muhammad, Omega Sapphire. I remember even words coming from Chicago stating that I am embarrassed by Tony Muhammad for it appeared to me he was an Omega before he was an honest black man. Mm. <coughs> and of course we can authenticate your Q-dom because it was Brother Khaled who brought you over. Who also is an Omega sci-fi and raised Tony Muhammad in Atlanta and it was Tony Muhammad who was in the, in the car with Khaled when he was picked up and arrested and taken to Atlanta prison where he served two to three years. Tony Muhammad was with him at that moment. Has a nation of Islam ever worked with the government before? Sure. Let's go back to the alleged assassination attempt by Corbella and Shabazz, whose family was being devastated to the point that Betty ain't here now, burned by the four men yet identified because of her book, dealing with the unanswered questions of the death of her husband in spite of the fact that she took $50,000 never to speak again was awarded to her at the Apollo Theater in May of 94. At a program I refused to go to, invited by Eric Mohammed while I was in New York, it was during that period that we were breaking in on Brock, and Eric bundled the questions to Brock about his role with James Edward Best on the weekend before Collett was shot. I think that this opportunity will allow us to get to the bottom of a bunch of funky shit. And I stand accused. I put myself up for attack, repudiation, castigation, humiliation, extermination, urination, any nation you can get. I stand up to that to make sure that clarity and truth will become the residual of this truth-seeking excursion from those who feel they were falsely accused at this minute. I do want to state for the record, in fact, that if it was Steve Coakley that you wanted to get clear, on the tape smoke out is my home phone number, in which I say, if you have a disagreement about what I said, you can call me in person. I want to reflect that you did go to the radio, but you didn't go to me. And I can accept that, but I just want to make sure that no one would misunderstand that you did not lack for a chance to get to Brother Steve so you can shake him up and bug him for these truths. If you want him to get the truths, call him up and ask him for him, even though I was on the point to hear the show on my own initiation. Had an opportunity to go on the show, which I will at the appropriate moment. But I chose to give the other side a chance to get right on out there and state their case, which I think is very important. They need to be heard. We do need to hear their sides of this complicity on behalf of the government. Some things no black man could think of. Okay, brother Yo, Brother Marcus, what's up? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, uh, okay, go ahead. What did you think of the radio show today? I detected a little, little male threat. Did you hear it? Oh, oh yeah, I got, uh, I got my friends over. I was playing some of the show, and uh, we got uh, Brother Marcus here. Uh, uh, who you many of you all have heard on the tapes previously? Uh, uh, Brother Marcus, uh, what did you think of the show? Uh, I, I, I thought it uh, revealed uh, quite a lot of topics and it's like anxious. He failed to make a lot of connections in terms of what you were talking about. Came with a general. Speak up a little louder. He came up with a, a general threat that you had uh, uh, insulted the character of uh, the minister. But he didn't mention anything about change dates, 
about how they were specifically changed to the dates of the uh, uh, Atlanta uh, youth park tied with the New York. That's the allegation, which was that this other program had changed its dates. I was trying to hit you on the speakerphone so everybody can hear you, but you had to talk a little louder into the phone. But basically, you saw what I saw. Uh, we're waiting now to hear from Brother Collin uh, that um, he didn't answer. It, it, he, in fact, stated, I believe, at one point in the show that he didn't know which march came first or second or this or that. He didn't, and, and it was kind of unusual for him not to know that because it would be difficult to answer my allegation without knowing those things. And so uh, as he went about to, uh, and, and it, it was the typical, that's why I was just telling my friends here, uh, it was the typical nation response. Hey, man, we're going to beat you up, bro. We don't like this. you fucking with the men, so we'll beat you up. Well, brother, that was some old shit you used to do to weaker lights. People who didn't know much of what your history is in terms of how you do deal with people. And if someone was to strike back, where would they strike back at your ass at? Now, are you really sure you're ready for this? <laughs> right. So that's all. We were just sitting back waiting to see. on that time and laid down what was happening, you know. He was supposed to have been that next week. Did you hear Brother D-Don go out there and uh, attack me? Anyway, with a one-way out, I'm going to show you where the real killer was located. A shooter. A very important. Uh, 
about to hear from the man himself, Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad. He is going to break down the movements he started. Most people don't know that although he was the head of the New Black Panther Party, he had a whole Muslim movement. I'll let him tell you about it. Dr. Khalid was ready to start a plebiscite. Dr. Khalid wanted to develop the plans that the messenger had to build a nation here on this land in the South, getting from land from some of these states, just like the Republic of New Africa and the nation all people had talked about. The uh, Republic of Africa, New Republic of Africa, Republic of New Africa, um, got his idea of the states from Elijah Muhammad. And so the Panther program was the uh, uh, the general orders and the 10 point program of the, all of this is connected. It's just our attempt to rise up. But Dr. Khalid tells the entire story of how he was let back in the nation, but then put on ice, how they used him up until the million man March, how all this talk about atonement and reconciliation. And then the minister started ignoring his calls and, didn't want to talk to him, but then would do lectures threatening him and saying this and saying that. I'm going to let Dr. Khalid talk to you. He's going to tell the details. Listen to him. These are his words, his views. This is the truth that has never been taught. I have never heard anybody say that Khalid was let back in the nation and under what terms and what happened during that activity. Roll the tape. Dallas, Texas. We came in out of New Orleans. Hmm. Came in out of Houston, Texas. Brother, young brother, Quanell X with the new black Muslim movement uh, who has uh, joined and by God's grace and permission and guidance of the ancestors uh, deferred to my leadership. Oh, brother, I need, to, I need to mention to you, I do remember this. Uh, in the tape, Tony Muhammad repudiated Cornell X as not being a member of the nation. We've never associated to do some of the things you saw him do. I don't know what group he's with. I know they're Solomon or he could be this one or that one. But he did bring his name up and he did make sure that the nation had nothing to do with it. But Cornell, brother Cornell is uh, again, by God's grace, is with me. Uh, this young brother was put out of the mosque in Houston, Texas, mosque number 45. They call him, not in an affectionate way, they call him Khalid Jr. Mm -hmm. and put him out of the mosque. They said he was too black, he was too radical, he was too revolutionary. Mm -hmm. They said he was disrupting the study groups. And as they were studying the different study guides, he would question different points and issues and take them back to the most honorable Elijah Muhammad's teachings from Message to the Black Man and Fall of America. And he questioned the book, uh, The uh, Torchlight for America, written by Minister Farrakhan, and made a comparison uh, of that book and the honorable Elijah Muhammad's book, the most honorable Elijah Muhammad's book, uh, Fall of America. So he left and started what was called MFOI, and now uh, we are working together on the new black Muslim movement. New means that, of course, there will be the foundation, the essence, and the core of the old. But there will be, given the uh, conditions, the current, the contemporary conditions that the black man and black woman is facing, there will be some new approaches to that. Uh, so Brother Cornell came in with troops out of Houston 
and they came with their shotguns, their rifles, and assault weapons. Uh, we had a Reverend Brown to come in out of New Orleans, uh, and out of uh, Dallas, and out of Fort Worth. We had Brother Aaron Michaels, who is the founder of the New Black Panther Party. And now, uh, again by God's grace and permission, has the New Black Panther Party met the other day and asked that I officially be the uh, Supreme Minister of the uh, New Black Panther Party or National Chairman, and that Brother Aaron Michaels uh, would be the Minister of Defense because we work uh, so, so, so well together. And Brother Robert uh, would be the local chair of the New Black Panther Party in uh, Dallas and in the Fort Worth, Arlington area. Uh, of course, we came in with uh, shotguns and rifles and assault weapons, uh, Brother Panthers and Sister Panthers. Some of the former members of the Nation of Islam, top soldiers, crack soldiers, uh, polished professionals came in, and some who had served in uh, Desert Storm and various wars for the devil, or so-called wars for the devil, joined us, brought their rifles and shotguns. Hmm. Brother Hiram Ashanti out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and uh, Brother Mel and others, our uh, legal counsel for the day, Attorney Malik Zulu Shabazz, and Brother Talib Muhammad came in out of D.C. At points all around the area, we converged on Jasper, Texas. The old no good sheriff to go line with, with the Honorable Marcus Garvey and Du Bois and others. And then a little while later, he didn't have to be talking to me, but everybody thought he was, including me. He said, um, if you if you turn against this, we will kill you if you turn against this. Because, and we went on to say, because if you try to mess this up, you are worthy of death. So everybody said, when it's over, brother, you be careful. Did you hear what he said? Mm -hmm. I said, yes, sir. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. I heard what he said. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, you get well, I'm not sure he was talking to me. Uh, I don't know. out of his mouth when he said to me 
assassinated Arlene, called him right after my assassination attempt. Minister Farquhar said he didn't even know that there had been an assassination attempt on my life. That for some reason he didn't watch TV that evening. He was tired. He went in. He went to sleep. He didn't know nothing all that night. He found out about it much later, and then Arlene called in a panic on the phone. And uh, he told him, don't put whatever it was on the phone. Come to Chicago. And then Arlene came to Chicago and said that he had been talking back and forth to former minister Abdul Haq Muhammad, a uh, servant of the truth Muhammad, a uh, slave named James Beth. And that they had been talking back and forth and that they had also met in D.C. at a Lyndon LaRouche conference mm -hmm. and that he thought the conversation that they both had about me, that he might have helped push James Beth over the edge or helped set the climate. So I said that night at Howard University, you got an old nigga in this town, old Negro in this town, who helped set the climate, so and so, so and so, old Aline Muhammad, and it came out in the Source magazine. So they were having a national laborers meeting, and Tony Muhammad was no doubt sitting in that audience when he said I was there. They didn't bring me in to bring me back. They brought me in and questioned me about what I had said about Arlene. And then I told them, all of, none of them knew this. The old Leonard Farrakhan, the chief of staff and son-in-law, the uh, supreme captain, Sharif, the son and assistant supreme captain, uh, Mustafa, I don't know who, and Arlene was in the room. Everybody else was in the University of Islam gymnasium at the National Ministers, Captains, Secretaries, and all of the National Laborers, where I assume Tony Muhammad was, that he was referring to. And I said to all of them, look, I didn't make this up. I got this from the minister's mouth. I said, but I didn't say that that night at Howard University because I didn't want the minister implicated in being the source of the information. And they were all like shocked. The minister said that. Uh, I said, I told Arlene, it was the minister who told me that you said it. Himself. So they were, and then I got on all of them because we spent a couple of hours or so in there. All they were doing was, it looked like Arlene was supposed to be getting some money or something from the government for some age research or for this. Then they were felt it was going to hurt bad, all the different security contracts and then they were talking about because the Jews were on them because of me and fighting them not to have any more federal housing contracts because of this racist, anti-Semitic image that they were using, that, 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 that quote unquote, according to the Jews, that was being used by the Jews, so-called Jews. And um, on top of that, they didn't want Eileen brought into court, hauled into court on conspiracy to commit murder charges, they said. So I said, uh, I don't know what degree he was involved. He tried to make it appear that he wasn't. And I said, but when you have an assassination attempt, you're almost killed and four or five other people get shot around you. I said, you leave no stone unturned and everybody is suspect. I said, but they said, well, the minister's waiting for us in the gym and he's ready to bring you back. And and we want you to work with us on the Million Man March. And all of the laborers are over there waiting for you, but the minister wants to know that we've resolved this over here. I said, well, I can't go out there and lie. I said, but I will say this. I will say that I feel that it was unfair of Source Magazine not to ask my permission and that I wouldn't want any unfairness to have to follow uh, I'll leave him around the rest of his life. I will at least say that I told, and I did, I called Source and told him to stop that part of it. Don't print it. Leave it out. I called him, I can't count how many times I called. Maybe I called six or seven times. And they claimed they would. And then they claimed it was too late. I talked to some, I can't think of the brother's name right now. He was a top, one of the top editors or something. And he said it was already going to
Of course, it was a touching moment for me. There was a while before I could say anything, and I stood in pride. Some others pride in the audience. Some of my starkest enemies, as Malcolm had during his day, and as Minister Farrakhan had when during his day back then, they didn't applaud too much, and they didn't shed no tears at all. I looked at to, I looked for them to study their faces, and I went on to uh, say that I would try to be more profound. And less profane. I didn't mean saying God damn it and all that. I mean uh, that which offended whatever the minister's policy was and all of that. I said, let's be more profound and less profane, I said. And uh, I was officially brought back. I thought the paper came out saying uh, that Khalid Muhammad resumes post. Because I wasn't clear and I called back to headquarters and the secretary couldn't tell me what my return meant. And I had to wait for the paper. I said, whatever the paper says, that's it. When the final call came out, it said, resumes his post. So that put everybody to sleep. All the people stopped asking questions about Khalid Muhammad. We now right up to the time of the Million Man March and cool that whole thing out. But the paper said he returned, he's returning as a minister. A minister. I said, oh, this ain't right. This is something funny. If I'm resuming my post, I was the top minister in the nation of Islam. National assistant. When he appointed me national assistant, he said in front of everybody, there's nobody between you and me now, brother. And he went on to say what kind of minister he needed over the rest of the ministers. And now you have a stern taskmaster. He's skilled in debates. There's none of you who are greater in the, in the knowledge of the teachings of the Arab Elijah Muhammad and he's the best that I have. He went through all of that with all of his ministers and said he was putting me over the minister's class. But uh, for it to say a minister, I knew that that meant something was wrong because it didn't say I was being uh, restored to my post as national assistant and representative for him. Um, and I called the next day and I said, that he was not available, his secretary, uh, uh, Sophia. I said, sister, uh, that's Sophia. I said, uh, sister, uh, let him know that, that I, I read the paper. Let him know that I'm ready. I'm standing by for any instructions. Whatever he wants me to do, I'm ready to do it. Let him know. We had had that little brief meeting. He told Sharif and he told Mustafa, his son. He said, I'm bringing him back. He said, the original plans we had for him, who had been my top captain and top minister, to help the two of you bridge the gap between the ministers and captains, we're ready to implement the program. Because he said to me, if you want to go on and start your own movement, I won't fight you. And I'll tell them now, don't fight him. He decides to do that. I said, no, sir, brother minister. I want to be with you. I want to be at your side, and I want to help you. And that's when he said, all right, we're ready to implement the program. And, and uh, I thought that's what it meant. So I kept calling. Nobody ever got back with me. I kept saying, I'm ready to go. But they did let me, when the, when the other ministers who loved me read it in the paper, they all, several of them, invited me to their cities right away to help pump up the Million Man March in their city. But the day before the Million Man March, uh, Attorney Malik Shabazz and I and some others and uh, Brother Steve, we had the Black Nationhood, Black Holocaust Conference hosted by Attorney Malik Shabazz. And all night that night, uh, different officials of the Nation of Islam, in particular Ben Chavis, who I'll never call Benjamin Muhammad, and uh, uh, what's his name, his son-in-law, uh, 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 I can't forget, uh, what's his son-in-law's name? Leonard, Leonard, uh, Leonard Farrakhan was saying that this is not a million man march event because the TV and CNN, C-SPAN was, car was carrying it as a, a pre-million man march event. They were encouraging the people not to come and everything. They had been sending security for me in every city, and including in D.C., where I had spoken for the million man march. That night they sent no security. The night before the million man march, Shafton, 
Little Charlton, uh, Dr. Leonard Jeffrey, uh, Dr. Uh, Francis Press Welsing, different ones that were supposed to be on the program. I think Dr. And, and Karinga. Marlana Karinga. Certainly Dr. Karinga and Reverend Sharp opted not to be on our program after they had accepted that night. I don't know their reasons. Now, Reverend Sharpton said that he had another uh, engagement and there was some problem with the flight. We had to take him at his word. Uh, Dr. Karanka gave uh, some acceptable reason for not being there also. We had to take him at his word. But they did not appear with us that night. Dr. Wilson didn't show. I think Dr. Jeffries came. He came, but they didn't let him speak, I don't think, the next day at the Million Man March. I think you're absolutely correct about that. Upton uh. and Carrega were able to speak. Reverend Sharpton and Dr. Carrega were, they had to make a choice. Whether they told him they had to make a choice or not, I think they made it relatively clear. Did you either speak over there with him or you speak over here with us at the Million Man March on the mall, even? Uh, and, uh, hey, Brother, Brother College, you got any uh, closing statements uh, uh, before we close out this program? Yeah, just a, a couple of uh, closing statements. I hate to hear Minister Tony Muhammad, who I know very well, and I trained him and taught him at many tapes where he tells the audience uh, how he was with me every day and how I trained him beyond any shadow of a doubt. I hate to hear him or any member of the nation talk about, don't, did you say they said, don't mess with us? We got all this pit up frustration. Did they say that? Yes. I hate to hear that. <coughs> because it seems to be this readiness to beat up black people. This readiness to kill a black man. You know, you got all this pit up frustration for a black man. Where's your goddamn pit up frustration for the white man? Right. I don't hear you beating up no white folks. <laughs> and they come and shut your damn mosque down. Those Put your mosques. shit on the streets. White, white men do their shit on the street with the sheriff. And you didn't, what about all your pit up frustration then? Mm -hmm. <laughs> what about it's Brother Shane Bird? You, you, the disciplined, trained FBI, could have gone to, to that town and made a big difference among the black people and done a whole lot to put a whole lot on a whole lot of Peckerwood mines. Not only in Jasper, but all in any mine in the nation. Here's a man I ain't never done nothing to. And he really ain't seen me do nothing to Minister Farrakhan. I don't have the power to do nothing to Minister Farrakhan. I would have been back. I probably would have subordinated a lot of my feelings and my drive to fight this goddamn beast. But I saw the nation doing a lot of changes and turns. I would have even probably tried to make all the changes and turns. But after the door was closed in my face, after the phone communication and phone lines were cut off, but the, no open lines of communication for me, after me showing up in, in person over and over, hoping that would do it, sending letters, after a point, you got to move on with your life. So I decided if there's no place for me where I love to be in the nation of Islam, then I've got to now regroup, go on with my life. I'm not going in a closet and hide for no goddamn body. I have to stand up and fight this beast the way that I feel that God has put it in me to fight this beast. That's my position. And brother, one last thing. I was changing the tape when you made the comment about whether or not you would allow someone to shoot at you again. I said I would never. That's another reason, not just to stand up with our God and with our guns to set an example of self-determination and self-defense uh, for black men all over America and the world and black women and black youth that we will begin to defend ourselves wherever we are. Not just, that's the primary reason. Another reason, the secondary reason is no one will ever shoot at me again. And we not be able to shoot back or catch you going for your stuff and deal with you appropriately. I would hope that 
I hope you got the rest of it about the security system where we don't do a lot of checking on a lot of places. We check some places. But we try to keep as many guns around as possible. Uh, they say, well, Comet don't believe in Allah. You don't believe in God. That's, that's why he got them guns. I believe in God. I believe in Allah. And I believe in the gun. And I believe that God will bless us to shoot straight when it's time to shoot straight. Can't beat that, brother. I love you, brother. Uh, I need to figure out a time, either tonight or in the morning, that we uh, go through some of this tape so that you can be as best prepared as possible. Oh, okay, you know, I never think you we got around to the number five. Right, right. As you can see from his words, Dr. Collier was very hurt. This was a very, very transformative and destructive period in his life. Straight from his mouth, you heard what happened. The minister did not want reconciliation with Dr. Khaled. The minister wanted to use the energy of Khaled to make that moment happen so he could be considered a Messiah figure. More famous, more money, keep his preacher friends, his new class of people who he is aligned to. This is the thesis, antithesis, old Machiavellian technique, where the CBC, the boule, they're the black gentry. Then you have a person over here talking revolutionary, Ms. Frakon, but he's with them. They cool. And they have a plan. And their plan is, let's keep the bank going. Let's keep our agenda going. And what is Mr. Farrakhan's agenda? Mr. Farrakhan's agenda is to be famous, to have lots of money, and to go down in history as a Messiah figure. It is not, absolutely not, to build any form of institutions and governance at all. If I'm wrong, since 1977 to 2024, which is almost 50 years, where is the nation? It was never intended to be built. In the Elijah's Vision documentary, I go into greater detail on why. That'll be out in a couple of days. But for the sake of Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad, we know he had to go. Now, can we blame Minister Farrakhan for poisoning Dr. Khalid? Of course we can. Can we blame Minister Farrakhan for a Nation of Islam member, James Edward Best, and another unidentified brother for shooting Dr. Khalid with suspicious Moss number 27, FOIs securing him at a time where just a few months earlier he had dismissed Khalid after his secret cabal meeting with uh, Kwesi and Fumu and Jesse Jackson. Can we blame him for that? Did he pull the trigger? Of course he did not. Did he state from his own mouth, which I did not put in here, by the way, but y'all seen that. The video is literally on YouTube. You can go. He's rebutting the things about Dr. Khaled, and he says from his own mouth that Allah did it himself, end quote, meaning killed Khaled Muhammad. After he's dead, that is your quote. If I'm lying, I could be sued for defamation, and y'all know I'm not lying. And so, for you, dear brother, not so brotherly, to come before the world made it to YouTube. I remember the meeting. I was in Moss number 12, sitting in the audience while brothers was cheering. I said, what the hell is this? First of all, you were at a fallen soldier. Regardless of whatever emotions y'all had between each other, 
for you to get up and say Allah did it himself, meaning Allah killed Khalid Abdul Muhammad. What? Allah. This is where religion goes mad. Are you telling me that Master Farad Muhammad killed Khalid Abdul Muhammad? Because that's one of us. Are you telling me that the black nation killed? Who? What? Uh, the mystery God? Allah? It doesn't even matter. Your Allah, Mr. Farrakhan's Allah, will kill Khalid Muhammad for having a disagreement, a peaceful disagreement. Khalid never brought no soldiers to hurt Mr. Farrakhan. Khalid didn't even have it in his energy field to hurt Minister Farrakhan. Do you mean to tell me a man who is wishing you no physical harm, who is only challenging you in what you are doing based on your teacher's words is worthy of death? Hmm. But the same God has not killed the child traffickers, the Rothschilds, the DuPonts, the Rockefellers, which according to us, we were taught that at six years old, he saw himself throwing them into a lake of fire. Never did we ever hear the honorable Elijah Muhammad say, Master Farah Muhammad saw himself throwing lost founds who just came up from the ashes of genocide into a lake of fire. Minister Farrakhan is a hoax of the most elite type. There is and will never be anyone more slippery and trickery than Lewis Walcott. And y'all have a hard time with that. I don't because I'm honest and I know what I see when somebody is playing God games and trickery on susceptible hearts and minds. Khalid did not get killed by Allah. As a matter of fact, Allah don't kill nobody in the sense of the mystery God. <laughs> Men and women are the consequence of the causes and effects of the laws of the universe with the law of possibility being the highest. And we were all taught this. The sole purpose of the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was to end the mystery God teachings so we would not be spooky. No matter how you chalk this up, for you to speak on a fallen soldier loved by millions of people, even his own family members, and go behind a mic and say that, says that you are suffering right now. According to your own mouth, the pain is so deep, the natural medicine won't work, the medication won't work, you can't use the bathroom, you got tubes tied to everywhere, every hole. Who is being chastised but you? Allah, the mystery God, or whoever you believe, won't even let you die. You are suffering because you are a liar. Khalid Muhammad was a great brother who trusted too many Negroes and it caught up with them eventually. That is what happened to him. Last, but not least, is the commentary from this young man, Malik Zulu Shabazz. Now, Malik Zulu Shabazz did an interview with Brother Sutek and my good brother, Sanetta. And out of all the people who were coming down on his head during that college situation, I'm talking about Black Panthers in his own party was coming down on his head. Black Power people was coming down on his head. The whole goddamn nation was coming down on his head. Like, what is going on here? Yeah. Alton Maddox was coming down on his head. Steve Copeland coming down on his head. All these people coming. 
out of all of the ones coming down on his head, he took the time to mention me. Out of all those people. Me. Little O'Ali at the time that he made this statement damn near 10 years ago. Because I did a people's indictment and I posed the questions and I said, we should subpoena Malik Zulu Shabazz to come answer these questions. And in the video, he's saying, y'all can just call me to the witness stand. Well, I did that. So why do you have a problem with me, brother? Here's why you have a problem with me, and I'm going to lay this out very simply. No, first, let's let you state what you stated about me. They think that I'm gunning for some kind of spotlight or right. attention right. when they totally misread me. Right. I never wanted to be the chairman of the new Black Power right. Party. That's my next I wanted right. to be his <laughs> spokesman and his attorney and be me. I was so comfortable being me. Right. And he was perfectly placed at being him. Right. So there was never a thought in my mind. And, and for somebody to accuse me of that, right. and for people like, uh, 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 oh, oh, no good, um, Ali Muhammad. Uh -huh. um, to make videos and to try to do all that. Ali Muhammad never called me to the table and said, brother, I got questions about his death. And frankly, sir, I got questions about you. I'll mm -hmm. sit with you. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to bring 20, 30 men around and get defensive and say what you want. And if you say something, you know, try to, right, try right, to if you want, he's not my property. Right. Dr. Muhammad is the property of the black nation. Right. But, you know, many people try to think that it some, has something to do with me blowing up or me getting the attention. Brother, uh, it, never, it was never like that. I'm totally I'm insulted by that. Right and really, to be honest, I mean, I be yeah. calm about it. I can take it. But right. at, some, at some point, I have wanted to hurt people right. who have said that, that, right. that I would harm the man that meant everything to me in my life. Right. right. Okay, now that being stated. Heard it for yourself. Okay, so Malik Zulu Shabazz, you are the one who wrote the report in the Panther News. You're the one who got behind cameras. You're the one who stated that the vomit was collected by you and placed in a secure place, but you left it too long. You are an attorney. You collected evidence from the scene that we never got to test. You also stated that blood was drawn from Dr. Khaled's body and in his sister, quote, Atlanta chapter, according to your report, that you wrote, sabotage the blood. But you never mentioned her name. Imagine somebody sabotaging blood that we're trying to test to see whether or not uh, poison was given to our brother and you never mentioned her name. You just said Atlanta chapter sister. Why are you protecting her if she's a possible criminal? So now the vomit is gone. The blood is gone. And you did a report to say Khalid Muhammad died of natural causes. Let's move on. Basically. Then. Eric Muhammad, the son of Ture Muhammad. Goes and takes footage of the body of Khalid to make sure that there was an autopsy. Y'all confiscated the camera. Y'all have those photos to this day. Because Eric was suspicious. I don't know what he saw when he took those pictures. But y'all took them. Y'all never presented those photos to the public. You say, well, that would desecrate a Muslim's body. Where is that in the Quran? I read all 114 surahs. I ain't never see that. Y'all make stuff up when it's convenient. So here's the thing, dear brother Malik Zulu Shabazz. You've never asked, answered these questions. These questions were posed 10 years ago. According to you, since you mentioned me, you read the questions. And in the interview with Sutek, you didn't answer him. What happened to the vomit? What happened to the blood? Why are you the only one speaking for Kiana and Bush? 
Why did you and Hashim Zinga get cool with Minister Farrakhan right after the death again? Why, why, why? And he died of hypertension, or excuse me, cerebral hemorrhage due to hypertension. Dr. Kali never wanted to work out. That's your words. Hmm. Dr. Kali was in Jasper, Texas, breaking through barricades from his own mouth in this documentary. You hear him saying that the saltines was tired in that hot heat in Jasper. And y'all was just breaking through barricades. You talking about a man who ate how to eat to live most of his life. Have y'all ever seen Dr. Khaled Muhammad? Shiny face, slim build, always fit. Dr. Khaled, the one who did a speech in New York, which we have on tape, which y'all try to say he was sick, is on YouTube. Then he traveled down to the NBA All-Star Game in Washington, D.C., talking to the, all the players, trying to get these young pick brothers to understand, look, we about to build. Then they drove from Washington, D.C. to South Carolina, ate at a Waffle House, according to y'all. Then he drove all the way to Atlanta, got with his wife, had dinner with her that night, made love. He's doing all of this, and he's sick. The stress. Oh yeah. I know I know I know the stress of a Khalid Muhammad from what I do. Khalid Muhammad was 53 years old. I am 48 years old. So he was five years older than me. With the same how to eat to live teachings. We've advanced those things since then, of course. But my point to y'all is. Y'all lying. And just like every other assassination that has happened amongst our people, you got a bunch of people pointing fingers to try to confuse people. Here's my summary. And this is, I just have to say this and be careful. My allegations and presumptions are that Minister Farrakhan wanted Khalid Muhammad dead. As a matter of fact, he went on and stated on record that his God, whoever that is, did it. According to Mr. Farrakhan, his Allah killed Khalid Muhammad. He had death in his mind for Khalid. James Best, who we have photos of, we showed you. We're showing you. No one's talked to him. Who gave him $25,000? Who gave him that rental? Who gave him those guns? He never talked. He was F-O-I. Dr. Aline never talked. He talked a lot. And Steve Coakley pointed it out here. Khalid said it himself. That Minister Farrakhan tried to rat out Aline. As the culprit. But that was a tactic to turn people against each other. You have to understand how a joker works. The alliances were made. Everybody went up after Khalid died, who was afraid of him remaining alive. Death by poison, throwing up and vomiting and defecating on yourself. All of that cleaned up, none of it tested by you know who, Malik Zulu Shabazz, according to him. Toxicology report was done by the state. Autopsy allegedly done. And a man who fought with Idi Amin, 
who was getting millions of dollars from Muammar Gaddafi, who was uh, an inheritor of the movement of the most powerful black man ever to exist in America, Elijah Muhammad, get shot at, shot, almost dead, then later dead. What we have here, my brothers and sisters, is vintage counterintelligence programming. And it is sad in one sense, but in another sense, it is valuable data to collect so that we who are here will know who is who and we will stay alive. I know what type of agent Malik Zulu Shabazz is. Yeah, we know. We know who you tried to pull up on. One of our brothers. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We know that. We know. We know. And then, just to close this out, this documentary, Malik Zulu Shabazz, as you saw in, in that clip, gives a dry threat to kill me or cause me harm. Let's say that. Let me say for the record, for everybody watching these documentaries, this is a different thing. Not only are we recounting the life of a great man and we're going over the lessons, it's actually a warning. The warning is now you have something present that you can't stop, that you can't kill, that you can't erase. And as Ella May says, You on a shot clock. You on a shot clock. The time is ticking. And we going out Lamar Jackson style, baby. So thank you for tuning in to Aboriginal Global Media. I am your host, Dr. Ali. We will be bringing you more and more documentaries on Dr. Sabi and others and great leaders in the black community. You see our indigenous documentaries. You have documentaries on health and other things. We want to come and tell the real stories of what happened to our people because we love our people and we're here to tell them and to announce to them that success is now present. The victory is here and you should jump on board so that you can sail off into the sunset of Ra, of Hoon, and we can live as kinfolk into eternity and we can bury these maggot pathogen Negroes who have taken away from our success because they don't see the bigger picture. Asalaamu Alaikum. Peace. Hotet. Shalom. All of the great words of peace in indigenous language all across the planet. We love you and we thank you for tuning in. Peace. Thank <laughs> you.